Uh, I want to welcome you to the ninth annual lecture in honor of Lieutenant Commander Eric S. Christensen. Lieutenant Commander Christensen was a man of unusual talent, uh, cultivation, and valor. He graduated with honors from the United States Naval Academy in 1999. He taught English classes at the academy while also attending the Graduate Institute at St. John's College. He was a lover of the arts and literature and of the French language. In 2005, while serving as a task unit commander of a SEAL team in Afghanistan, he led a mission to rescue a SEAL reconnaissance squad that was engaged in a firefight with overwhelming Taliban forces. He and 10 other SEALs died in that effort. And for his service, he was awarded the Bronze Star with a V for Valor and the Purple Heart. He survived by his father, Admiral Edward K. Christensen, and his mother, Suzanne Christensen, who are both in attendance this evening. The friends and family of Commander Christensen established this memorial lecture series to create closer ties between his two alma maters in Annapolis and to stimulate thought about civilian military relations and about the place of a liberal arts education in a civic and a military education. This lecture series is sustained annually by generous gifts given in memory of Lieutenant Commander Christensen and by the Navy SEAL Foundation. And I wanna to mention too that um, Thomas C. Maher, uh, a chief foreign officer and a retired Navy SEAL, uh, was a gentleman who was um, instrumental in acquiring funds to support the lecture series and recently passed away and I wanted to note his passing um, and thank him for his help in supporting this series. We have often scheduled this series near the croquet match um, in the thought that just as we bring midshipmen and Johnnies together uh, to compete and celebrate on the front lawn, uh, we can also convene as well to share in our educational and intellectual uh, pursuits. I'm especially pleased to introduce tonight our lecturer, Professor Jeffrey R. Makris. Professor Makris was a career naval officer and a pilot. In his second career, he's been a professor of history at the Naval Academy, where he earned Military Professor of the Year Award in 2016. He earned his doctorate with distinction at Johns Hopkins uh, at the School of Advanced International Studies, where he also earned a master's in Middle East Studies. He's the author of a monograph, Politics and Security in the Gulf, Anglo-American Hegemony and the Shaping of a Region. As well, he is also the editor and contributor to Imperial Crossroads, Great Powers, and the Persian Gulf. His research uh, views Middle Eastern states in the light of their development over the last several centuries, and he's examined the role of great powers in monitoring and policing the international crossroads. Professor Makris is also the Deputy Director of the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership at the Naval Academy. And he's been a great supporter of the Socratic Seminars, something that's emerged in the last year or two, uh, which have brought together Johnny's and Midshipmen Monthly for philosophical conversation based on speeches and um, key to selections and great books. And this has been the most sustained engagement of the two schools to my memory. I'm therefore very pleased to welcome him to speak tonight. His lecture is entitled, The Enduring Relevance of Thucydides' Peloponnesian Wars. Please join me in welcoming Professor Makras. About a 10 minute walk here from St. John's College, overlooking the Severn River, lies the Naval Academy Cemetery, the final resting place for St. John's College alum and U.S. Naval Academy alum Eric Christensen, for whom tonight's lecture honors. These two colleges have stood side by side for nearly two centuries, but their students often remain in separate orbits. Eric was an exception, having studied at both. Over the past several weeks, I've reached out to friends and associates of Eric's, trying to get to know who he was. I've spoken with high school classmates, Naval Academy crew team teammates, a roommate during his time at St. John's, 
and someone who studied with him here in the St. John's graduate program. And the picture that emerges is one of a great Renaissance man who fully inhabited the space of both the letters and that of the naval officer. Consumed by books, he lived the life of the mind. Some people told me he was the epitome of the poet warrior. And it's clear that his life has embodied the ideals of both colleges. A quest for knowledge, a love for the humanities, a drive to learn and apply the lessons of the past, and a call to serve. Well, this past year, as the dean just mentioned, some professors and students from both colleges have aimed to draw the students of both schools closer together to one another, as Eric no doubt would have encouraged. For a few nights each semester, over a shared meal, Johnny's and midshipmen have met in a so-called Socratic society, and using St. John's famous pedagogy of the guided discussion, they've explored some of mankind's most insightful texts. And several of those discussions have surrounded the ancient Greek author Thucydides and his book, The History of the Peloponnesian War. You know, despite having been penned 24 centuries ago, it still holds an enduring relevance. So in my talk tonight, I'd like to explore why students of history, of international relations, of military affairs, why students of the human condition still find meaning in this book. You know, there exist a multitude of reasons, but tonight I'm gonna to discuss my top four. First, it represents the first work in my mind of what we might call objective history. Second, it serves as the, one of the earliest and most complete enunciations of the values of the West. Third, it addresses the strengths of Athens' direct democracy, but also its weakness, the fickleness of the people. And fourth, Thucydides debates why states act and why they fight. Is it for moral reasons or is it for self-interest and power? So before we start, we should probably put the Peloponnesian War in some context. Thucydides lived in ancient Greece approximately 2,400 years ago. The Greeks had just prevailed in one of the most unlikely military victories of all time. In 490 BC at the Battle of Marathon, many small Greek city-states defeated the mighty Persian Empire, the world's first superpower. And in the succeeding decades, the largest of the Greek city-states, Athens, built an alliance the so-called Delian League, to protect against the Persians. First, they invited other Greek city-states to participate and to pay, and then they compelled them. And Athens' growing power led to rising resentment. Tensions rose, and two factions emerged, the Athenians and their allies, and the Spartans and theirs. They came to blows in 431 BC and fought for nearly three decades. In the end, the Spartans prevailed, shattering Athens' empire. We know very little about Thucydides the man. He fought as a strategos, or a general, for the Athenians, and he suffered a military setback, we hear, early in the war. He was exiled and devoted the rest of his life to chronicling the war. Which leads to my first point tonight. Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War represents the first work of what we might call objective or scientific history. Now, to be sure, chroniclers have recorded human events since the dawn of writing. But those accounts often attributed causation to the whims and fancies of the gods. You know, they praised their own countrymen more than they should. And sometimes they deified the leaders of their own states. In short, they weren't objective. Thucydides set out to write a different kind of account. You know, he says, quote, most people don't take the trouble in finding out the truth, 
but they're much more inclined to hear the first story they hear. He continues, quote, the absence of romance in my history, I fear, will detract some up from its interest. But if it's judged worthy by those inquirers who desire an exact knowledge of the past as an aid to understanding the future, well, I will be content. Well, taking advantage of his neutral status that his exile provided, and perhaps taking advantage of some inherited wealth that allowed him to pursue a life of scholarship, he met and interviewed participants from both the Athenian and the Spartan sides. He made personal visits to battle sites. He examined physical evidence. He painstakingly reconstructed over 100 speeches of statesmen. His book recounts the war from all sides, portraying the Athenians and the Spartans, sometimes in a good light, sometimes bad, but based upon the evidence. Thucydides' demand for objectivity sets him apart even from Herodotus, a Greek historian who a generation before had written about the Persian Wars. But he included what critics have said were legends and fanciful accounts. Herodotus begins some sections of his history with, it is said that, dot, 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 and then he repeats hearsay. Today, in the graduate training, historians are taught to seek and gather objective evidence, analyze it, come to independent conclusions, regardless of how popular or unpopular they may be. And the first to espouse that independent historical tradition was Thucydides, whom we can justifiably call the father of scientific history. So, that's the first reason why, in my opinion, Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War remains relevant today. It's the first example of objective history. Which leads to my second assertion tonight. Thucydides was one of the first to enunciate what we might call the values of the West. In his history, he reconstructs the funeral oration for the war dead that the Athenian leader Pericles delivered. What were those values? Well, here I'm going to quote directly from my old tattered copy of the Peloponnesian War. In it, Pericles praises Athens' ancestors. And he says that, quote, by their courage and their virtues, they've handed down to us a free country. A free country that's open to the world. An oblique condemnation of the Spartan police state whom they were fighting. He extols the virtues of Athenian democracy, where, quote, democracy is in the hands not of a minority, but of the whole people. He also praises their justice system and a notion of equality, saying that, quote, everyone is equal before the law. Now, we should probably note here that this Athenian democracy excluded women and the large number of slaves, as well as those who lived under the yoke of Athenian empire. But while their system certainly falls short of what we would today call the ideal society, their notion of participatory government was more sweeping than anything the world had ever seen up until that point. You know, Pericles notes that his countrymen were citizens and not subjects. And as citizens, they bore an obligation to participate in the state, not just serve it. And when needed, they must bear arms with their neighbors to protect it. And he summarized it by saying, quote, we do not say that a man who takes no interest in politics is a man who minds his own business. We say that he has no business here at all. Well, don't these words sound a lot like what Americans say is special about our own country? You know, in fact, some historians believe that Lincoln based his Gettysburg Address on the very words in this same Pericles funeral oration. So my key point so far, one, Thucydides marks the start of professionalized objective history, and two, his book includes one of the first enunciation of Western values 
Which leads me to my third reason why I think Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War remains relevant today. The recognition that direct democracies, while they reflect the will of the people, also reflect a glaring shortcoming, fickleness. In Athens, all male citizens were invited to the ecclesia, or the assembly, which met one to four times each month. Of a population of, say, maybe 30 to 60,000 Athenians, perhaps 6,000 attended regularly. In the assembly, they elected military leaders, they elected magistrates, they debated military strategy, they argued over, and they voted on laws. In the Mytilenean debate, a chapter of Thucydides' Peloponnesian War, the Athenian assembly debated what to do with the rebellious residents of Mytilene, a uh, city on the island of Lesbos. They had rebelled against Athens. And the Athenians, fearful of further revolt, hastily voted to execute all of the males of Mytilene and enslave all of the women and children, whether they were engaged in the rebellion or not. After voting, the assembly immediately dispatched a Navy warship to row out and impose the cruel sentence. Thucydides then recounts how the Athenians awoke the very next day and they lamented their hasty decision. They met again to reconsider. Cleon argued for keeping the harsh punishment as an example to others. Theodotus countered, arguing for moderation. Execute only the guilty, he pleaded. It's better to be seen by the world as reasonable. In this case, the moderates prevailed, and the assembly dispatched a second warship. And attempting to row faster than the first, the second ship intercepted it. And in the end, only those involved in the rebellion were punished. Well, Thucydides recounts this story, it appears to me, at least, in part at least, to highlight the fickleness of the people. Not just the Athenians in this case, but all people, everywhere and at any time. The masses, he suggests, can be swayed so easily by a clever argument, and their opinions can vary so wildly from one day to the next. Thucydides, if he were here today, would no doubt understand the unruly electronic mobs of today on Twitter and Facebook. While Thucydides doesn't explore what better forms of government might exist, Aristotle, from the next generation, and Polybius, two centuries later, did. They suggest that by combining the three primary forms of ancient governance, the direct democracy, the oligarchy, the monarchy into a system of systems, a state can slow down the wild swings of public opinion. They can make better decisions as a result of it. Our own nation's founders, who read Thucydides and Aristotle and Polybius and all the other classical writers, designed a constitution with all three systems embedded into it. The House of Representatives, close to a direct democracy of the ancient Greeks, a Senate, akin to an oligarchy, and a president, sort of a monarchy. The idea, slow down the decision-making and make decisions more thoughtfully and therefore better. So, one, Thucydides' Peloponnesian War represents the first work of objective history. And two, Thucydides enunciates the values of the West and three, the masses in a direct democracy are subject to wild mood swings. Which brings me to my fourth and final point tonight as to why Thucydides' Peloponnesian War remains relevant today. He debates why states act the way they do in the international realm and why they fight. Is it for moral reasons or for self-interest and for power? For students of international relations, the Melian Dialogue is perhaps the most read chapter of the book. Like the Mytilenean debate, the Melian Dialogue describes a discussion, 
a discussion between Athenian leaders and residents of another small island, this one, the island of Milos. The Melians wished to remain neutral in the Peloponnesian War and thus defy Athens' will. Athens dispatches diplomats to Milos. And I'll paraphrase here from the book. The Melians tell the Athenians, why don't you allow us to remain neutral? The Athenians quickly respond, because it will be seen as a sign to others of Athenian weakness, and we cannot allow that. And the Melians counter, but that's not fair. Everyone should have a right to make decisions for themselves. Don't you worry about your reputation as being seen as brutes? And to that, the Athenians replied, no. We're more worried about the example we would set if we allow one small state to challenge our authority, because it would embolden the others. And the Athenians continue, and they say directly and frankly, look, millions, don't be foolish. You're a small state. We are much more powerful. Cut a deal. Save your lives. We cannot and we will not let you go your own way. And the Melians thought about it, and they decided to stand on principle. They told the Athenians, we stand for what is right, for what is moral, and we trust that the gods will look after us. And in what might be the most often quoted lines in the entire book, the Athenians reply, and I'll quote here, it's a general and necessary law of nature to rule whatever one can. This is not a law that we made ourselves. We were not the first to act upon it. We found it already in existence, and we shall leave it to exist forever among those who come after us. We're merely acting in accordance with it. And they continue. Or Thucydides continues, and he says, the strong do what they have the power to do, and the weak accept what they have to accept. I'm going to repeat that. Quote, the strong do what they have the power to do, and the weak accept what they have to accept. This, then, represents the question that international relations theorists have debated for centuries. Why do states behave the way they do? Is it from a sense of morality and fairness, as Emelian suggests? Or is the international world governed instead by a few powerful states who do whatever they have the power to do, forcing the weak to submit to only what they must. For this, in addition to being called the father of objective history, Thucydides is also sometimes called the father of realism, the international relations intellectual framework that posits that states behave to maximize their own power not by notions of fairness, nor international norms, nor treaties, nor laws. Over the past six weeks, we've heard quite a lot about a large superpower demanding its smaller neighbor to submit. We've heard the smaller neighbor plead for fairness, for moral behavior, for all parties to follow international conventions, and we've seen the superpower defy those entreaties, demanding the smaller power submit or suffer the consequences. We're talking, of course, about Russia and Ukraine, whose situation eerily resembles the plight of the Melians, who attempted to, to defy their much more powerful neighbor, Athens. 
here in this very great hall in St. College College, St. John's College last fall, months before the Russian tanks poured across the Ukrainian borders in February, several dozen Johnnies and Mids debated the Melian dialogue. I was one of the facilitators in that room right there. And our discussion was filled with unease, as it normally does with this passage, as students wrestled with a dichotomy of what they thought should happen in contest between states and what actually does happen in practice. So, what did happen to the Melians 2,400 years ago? Well, Thucydides, Thucydides dryly writes, after the Melians refused to submit, the Athenians, quote, laid siege to the city, killed all the men, and enslaved the women. This debate that the Melian dialogue poses continues today. Thucydides would understand, no doubt, the nature of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Between a smaller power claiming justice and fairness versus a superpower that demands submission. Understanding these dichotomies between morality and power thus represents the fourth and the final reason why, in my mind, Thucydides' Peloponnesian War remains eternally relevant. So in summary, in my mind, while there are many reasons why Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War holds enduring relevance, four are most important. First, it represents the world's first work of objective or scientific history. Second, it serves as an early enunciation of what we might call the values of the West, values that Westerners still claim today. Third, he documents the perils of direct democracy and people's wild swings of emotion. Better to slow down the spread of decision making, he seems to suggest to us. And fourth, in his Melian dialogue, Thucydides explores why states act and fight, suggesting that dynamics of power, rather than morality, play a decisive role in interstate relations. My copy of the Peloponnesian War is torn up. It's dog-eared. It has yellow highlighter marks all over it. Writing, some pages are falling out. Previous editions have been passed down through the generations. And it's been about 100 generations from the time of the Greek Golden Age to today. Students of history, of international relations, of military affairs, students of the human condition would do well today to study its pages, just as the Johnnies and the Mids have been doing this year, in this very room, in the Socratic society. In closing, I'd like to thank the supporters of the Lieutenant Commander Eric Christensen lecture, Eric's parents, Admiral and Mrs. Christensen, thank you. To the leaders of St. John's College, President Nora Demleitner, thank you. Dean Joe McFarland, thank you very much. Lieutenant Commander Mike Sampala, a St. John's alum and one of the initiators of this lecture series, thank you. The organizers of the Socratic Society, including Dr. Jason Tipton, a tutor at St. John's, Army Lieutenant Colonel John Childress, Navy Lieutenant Commander Brian Rogers of the Naval Academy, Naval Academy Superintendent Vice Admiral Sean Buck, who approved this initiative to join these two schools closer together, I'd like to thank my own colleagues at the Naval Academy, some of whom are here, who instilled in me a classic love for these classic texts. And of course, I'd like to thank all of you here tonight. And finally, I'd like to thank two others. Lieutenant Commander Eric Christensen, in honor of a life well lived. And last but not least, I'd like to thank the old sage Thucydides, not lacking in self-confidence, this father of scientific history and the father of political realism, 
sensed that we just might be talking about him today, so many years later. Because he writes, in my final quote tonight, my work is not a piece of writing designed to, the meet, to meet the needs of an immediate public, but it was done to last forever. Thank you very much.